So in M, we're bringing this approach to app permissions. So with app permissions, we're giving users meaningful choice and control over the data they care about. You don't have to agree to permissions that don't make sense to you. And we're accomplishing this through a few big changes. First, we're greatly simplifying app permissions to a smaller set of easily understood things like location, camera, microphone. Second, apps will now ask you for permission the first time you try to use a feature instead of asking during app installation time. So let's take a look at how this could work with WhatsApp. Now, keep in mind when I installed the app, I wasn't asked to grant any permissions up front. Okay, so let's say I'm in the app and I want to send a voice message. When I press the mic button, the app makes a request to the system to access the microphone, which then brings up this permission prompt. The permission directly reflects the use case. And this is a one-time request, and of course, I as a user can allow or deny the request on a pair of permission basis. Now that I've granted the permission, I can hold the mic button and record a message, like so. So one of the things we've heard from our users is the desire to change or revoke an already granted permission. So at M, I can now go into settings, choose the app, see what permissions it has, and even modify them. I can also go <laughs> And I can also go the other way. So I can choose a permission, say microphone, and see which apps have access to it. Now, for developers, the new app permissions apply to apps compiled against the M SDK. Legacy apps targeting SDK versions before M will behave as before. One of the really nice side effects of the new permission model for app developers is it's faster to get users up and running in your app. We also know that with the old permission model, that adding a new permission to your app can affect your update adoption. With the new permission model, updates are seamless because user involvement is deferred until right when it's needed. Okay, so that's app permissions. This is a pretty big departure since Android 1.0, but it's a more intuitive model for users. It's a much more seamless app install process for app developers. So next up, let me highlight one of the ways that we're improving the web experience on mobile. So one of the interesting trends that we're observing on mobile today is around how web content is being consumed. And app developers increasingly care about the experience their users get when they tap on a web link from within their app. And today, you got two choices, right? You either make a big context switch out to the browser, or you build your own experience by embedding a web view within your app. And web views have this nice property that they enable you to make the transition to web content really seamless. And you can make it feel like one app. But while web views are powerful, they have some downsides. It means developers have to get into the business of building a browser, which is a complex and time-consuming thing to do well. And for the user, Rising content in web view means you lose some of the things that make users' lives really easy on the web, like save passwords or logged in sessions. So Chrome Custom Tabs is a new feature that gives developers a way to harness all of Chrome's capabilities while still keeping control of the look and feel of the experience. And we've been working with our friends over at Pinterest on this, and I'd like to show you a sample of what's possible. So here I am in the Pinterest app. Let's tap on something interesting. Now, when I tap on a web link at the bottom, you'll notice that there's a custom transition animation into Chrome custom tabs. Now, remember, this is actually the Chrome browser now running on top of your app. And the custom tab is branded the same color as Pinterest, so it feels like one experience. And you can even see that Pinterest has added a custom button to the toolbar to pin pages. And, then, and they can also add additional items to Chrome's overflow menu up at the top right. Finally, the back button gives an easy way to seamlessly go into the, into the app. So the custom tab was super fast to load because Pinterest was able to ask Chrome ahead of time to prefetch the content. And of course, the real benefit is for users. With Chrome custom tabs, you're signed into your favorite site since it uses Chrome State. And you get all of Chrome's features, such as safe passwords, all the filling forms, Google Translate, and more. And of course, you also get the benefits of Chrome's security model. So Chrome Custom Tabs is available today on the Chrome Dev channel, and we're excited about rolling it out to users in Q3 this year. So that's an example of how we're improving the web experience when you want to link from an app to the web. Now I'd like to talk to you about some improvements we're doing when you want to link from an app 
to another app. And linking is, of course, one of those fundamental principles of the web. It brings different websites together as part of a natural user experience flow. And as more and more web destinations get corresponding rich app experiences, for example, the YouTube app or the Twitter app, we've seen different attempts to enable linking between apps so as to apply those same fundamental principles of the web. Now, Android's intent system already provides a powerful way to enable an app to advertise that it can handle the rendering of a particular link pattern. But one of the limitations of the current system is that when a user selects a web link from somewhere, Android doesn't know whether to show it in the web browser or some other app that claims support for the link. As a result, Android will show the infamous disambiguate dialog to ask the user to choose. No. So in the end release, we're enhancing Android's intent system to provide a more powerful app linking capability. Apps can now add an auto-verify attribute to their application manifest to indicate that they want the links they claim they support to be verified by the platform. The Android platform will then make a request to the web server pointed to by the links at app installation time and look for a file containing the name and signature of the application. This enables Android to verify that the app owns the links it claims it does. So now, when I as a user tap on a verified link, let's say a Twitter link I received in an email, the Android platform will seamlessly write me to the Twitter app with no more disambig dialogue. So by putting app linking directly in the platform, we greatly improve the core user experience. Okay, so next up, we wanna give you a preview of an important initiative we're working on which we call Android Pay. And it builds on work we did in previous Android releases, such as near field communication, or NFC in Gingerbread, and host card emulation, which we introduced in KitKat. With Android Pay, users can simply and safely use their Android phone to pay in stores, wherever they see the Android Pay logo, or the NFC logo, or indeed in thousands of Android Pay partner apps. Android Pay is focused on simplicity, security, and choice. It's simple, because all you have to do is unlock your phone like normal, place it in front of the NFC terminal to pay, and there's no need to open any app. It's that easy. It's secure, because when you add a card for use with Android Pay, a virtual account number is created, which is then used to process your payment. Your actual card number is not shared with the store during the transaction. And you have choice. We built Android Pay as an open platform, so people will be able to choose the most convenient way to activate Android Pay, either through our app or through any supported banking app. And we're working with leading financial institutions so you can securely use your existing debit and credit cards with Android Pay. And of course, we're also working with major US mobile carriers, including AT&T, Verizon, and T-Mobile, to ensure that whenever you buy a new phone, you can walk out the door ready to go. And of course, Android Pay works with any Android device with NFC. Android Pay will work in over 700,000 stores across the US which accept contactless payments, including retailers such as Macy's, Bloomingdale's, McDonald's, Subway, and much more. Android Pay will also be available in-app from developers selling physical goods and services to help you speed through the checkout process. So leading developers like Lyft and Grubhub and Groupon and more will be offering Android Pay in their app soon. So we're at the start of an exciting journey. We believe the same partnership model that fueled Android's growth from a single device seven years ago to now more than a billion users will enable Android Pay to be successful too. And we're working closely with payment networks, banks, and developers to bring mobile payments to Android users around the world, with the rollout starting in parallel to launching M this year. Now, Android Pay works on phones from KitKat forward, but with the M release, Android Pay gets even better. Because it turns out that Android device makers have been including fingerprint sensors on devices since 2011. For example, with the Motorola Atrix, and most recently with devices like the Samsung Galaxy S5 and S6. In M, we're taking the opportunity to standardize support for fingerprint in Android. So it works across a breadth of sensors and devices and exposes a standard API to developers. So what does this mean? Well, for one, in M, you can use your fingerprint to authorize Android Pay transactions. So let's take a look at this in action. The user simply touches the fingerprint sensor, which unlocks the phone. The phone will then make a secure NFC exchange with the payment terminal. 
And then the payment goes through, and you get the Android Pay notification of the transaction at the top. Fast and simple. With the M release, you can also use your fingerprint to simply unlock your device or make Play Store purchases. Most importantly, any app developer can make use of the new APIs to add fingerprint support to their own apps. And we've been working with lots of our app partners on the new fingerprint APIs, and the feedback has been overwhelmingly positive. So for example, let's take a look at the new Target app, which is aiming to release later this year. Now, the user has previously associated their username and password credentials with their fingerprint, and that's a simple and popular design pattern we're seeing with app developers. Now, when the user wants to purchase something, they just present their fingerprint like so, and it will process the payment. Super easy. So let's talk about another big area where we've improved in M, and that's power. Now, Android has always enabled true multitasking as an open platform for developers, and people love that about Android. But in making the platform exceptionally flexible, there's a trade-off on data freshness and battery, especially if the user installs hundreds of applications. So in the spirit of improving the core experience, we're changing Android and M to be smarter about managing power through a new feature we call Doze. Now, many of us have bursty user patterns with our devices, especially with tablets. For example, you might leave your tablet on your coffee table or your nightstand all day, only to pick it up and use it to read a book or watch a movie in the evening. With M, Android uses significant motion detection to learn if a device has been left unattended for an extended period of time. In that case, it will exponentially back off background activity to go into a deeper sleep state. So what we're doing is we're trading off a little bit of app freshness for longer battery life. And we call it dozing because while the device is asleep, it's still possible for the device to trigger real-time alarms or to respond to incoming chat requests through high-priority messages. So how well does this work? Well, we took two Nexus 9s and we put Lollipop on one and M on the other, and then we loaded both up with the same account and lots and lots of applications. We put the two devices side by side and measured power. And I'm happy to say that we're seeing devices with M lasting up to two times longer in standby. Of course, no matter how much better we make power management in Android, sooner or later, you gotta recharge that device. So we wanted to improve that too. So we've been heavily involved in creating a new uh, USB Type-C standard. And Type-C ushers in a new way of charging that works across hardware, from cell phones to tablets to laptops, and everything in between. And it means we're going to start seeing really fast charging of devices as standard, anything from three to five times faster. And of course, USB Type-C connectors are flippable, and hence much more mobile friendly and durable. No more grappling to find the right direction for the charging plug. So we've been working with device manufacturers to bring Type-C devices to the market with the M release. And because Type-C is bi-directional, the M release adds the ability to select whether you want your device to be charged by the cable or instead for your device to act as the charger to whatever it's plugged into. So that's Type-C, coming to a phone near you soon. So there are hundreds of new features in M, and you'll find improvements to the core user experience peppered throughout the release. And it's really the little things that matter and add up. So for example, we've improved word selection in M. We now auto-select or chunk on each word boundary, and you can still drag backwards to go character by character. And we've also added an awesome floating toolbar for quick access to things like copy and paste. As another example, as another example, <laughs> we can make sharing easier. The system can now automatically learn which people and which apps you share with most frequently and make those available with just a single click. And if you weren't a big fan of the volume control changes in Lollipop, hands up who weren't fans of the Lollipop changes. Okay, the good news is we've simplified those uh, much easier. And as an example of the little details we polished and obsessed over, we've added a drop down to control the volume of individual audio streams, such as alarms and music. Okay. So the M release is still in development, but we're excited to.